to the podcast. Uh, the Dean Blundell Show podcast here at DeanBlundell.com. Uh, it's on YouTube, DeanTube. You can also get us on Twitch.com, uh, Dean Blundell TV, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, where you get your fine podcast tunes, whatever you call it. I'm almost tired of doing that because you probably know where you can get your stuff. Anyway, um, you can always get us at DeanBlundell.com and it's Dean Blundell on Twitter as well. Welcome to the show. A uh, busy day today. We'll get to it in just a second. I want to thank our partners. Owner's Box Weekly Fantasy Sports Center for your Owner's Box account. You get up to $100 deposit bonus today. Uh, if you love fantasy, Owner's Box is your premier weekly fantasy sports platform. Free to sign up. Totally customizable. Self-contained. Uh, you can play for free or real dough, and you can take advantage of that $100 deposit right now. You put in $100, they put in $100 on top of that. It's free money. Owner's Box matches that deposit. If you're dumb, you won't do it. If you're smart, you will. Make Sundays great again with Owner's Box Fantasy Sports. And sign up at ownersbox.com today. Uh, Blue Microphones, the official mic of DeanBlundell.com and the DeanBlundell.com podcast network sponsors of the Show Us Your Pod contest where we pick one lucky podcast uh, to join the network. And Blue is going to give the winner of the show um, in the Show Us Your Pod contest all new podcast. You get a new Yeti X mic, you get these headphones, and you also get a mic arm. Uh, just head to DeanBlundell.com. Uh, click on the Blue Mic Show Us Your Pod link. Enter now. Thanks to our friends at Blue Microphones, the official Mike of the DeanBlundell.com podcast network. And Gitch, Ed's Gitch, you want some? He's got it. Everybody needs underwear. Especially now. You can't go out. Everything's on lockdown. Just let them send it to you. It's premier underwear. It's got the pouch in the front, boxer briefs, super stretchy, super light, super breathable. And right now, if you order three pairs, you get one for free when you use promo code GITCH3. If you don't want to shop for anybody, you want to do it online, dads, boyfriends, GITCH. Ed's got it. Premier luxury underwear, four for the price of three right now when you use promo code GITCH3 at edsfineimports.com. Ah, Without further ado, please welcome to the program a fellow who has a podcast in the DeanBlundell.com uh, podcast network, uh, former Secret Service to uh, Barack Obama. He is a protection specialist from Silver Spear and the Spear Talk podcast. Please welcome Mr. Uh, John Guarnieri. Am I saying that right, Guarnieri? A- am I that wrong? That was perfect. <laughs> Almost from the motherland. That was good. I did it without looking at your name, too, because phonetically, I'm all fucked up if I look at your name. I'm like, I said to Sean before we started, I'm like, please tell me how we say John's last name properly, because I don't want to fuck it up. One year. Yeah, that's one of those things where if I think about someone's name or a difficult, like, city, I'm just like, man, I'm just going to say it. Like, I just just go with it. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> but right. you didn't have to, because I fucking nailed it. I dare you it. to correct me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, dude, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. I love, love, fucking love your podcast. Spear Talk. Um, you, you, you kind of roll through a whole bunch of different guests. Like you've got second amendment guys, you've got former military guys. You had a guy on, uh, that was doing like some kind of car rally last week. He was fucking phenomenal. Uh, you talk about protection, you talk about the state of the world, you talk about protecting animals, you kind of cover it all. So tell us a little bit about spear talk and a little bit about you. Yeah. So basically I started that out of boredom and at the beginning of COVID, maybe some fear, and I'll explain that. And back in March when, so I just got done off of, I did the European tour with Chai Down, and then I had two weeks off and then I jump on a rock cruise. I do, our company, Silver Spirit, does the Rock Legends cruise. And this year, Roger Daltrey was the headliner. Well, I'm doing security for Roger. We get back after a week and two days later, I get a call from Roger's tour manager. Hey, do you feel sick at all? And I'm kind of like, well, that's a weird question to ask. Like, oh, cool. I'm so thankful you're thinking of me. And he's like, no, no, a couple of the crew guys have COVID symptoms. In the back of my mind, I'm like, you mean the disease from China? Like, what are you talking about? And not to say I'm naive to what's going on in the world, but everyone's like, it's not going to come here. Like, it's not an issue. So whatever. Well, I, a week after that, it turns out Roger Daughtry and I, the only ones who didn't get sick. A week later, I've been to California, specifically San Francisco, checking out some clients with my CEO and office manager. The day we fly out, we get an alert on our phone. Hey, San Francisco is shutting down all traffic, all travel because of the virus. So when that hit, I'm kind of like, okay, this is a real thing. So we get home to the Florida office. We're sitting around and I see the NBA goes, hey, we're, we're postponing the season. And I'm like, it's the NBA. They're a bunch of sallies. And not to take away that they're athletes and stuff, but you, you, I, NBA, you always like, they're always rolling ankle. They get hurt, whatever. Well, literally two hours later, 
NHL is now postponed season. Okay, what the hell is going on? <laughs> I love how the NHL is like your measuring stick of toughness, too. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's one of those things where like, you never hear anything about – unless there's like a, uh, a shutdown or a – there's nothing you never – they, they just play through whatever. Yep. And um, when that happened, I'm kind of like, holy shit. So literally tours start getting canceled and different projects and events we're doing – and I'm like, man, what are we going to do? And the fear came in with the, well, this is what I love doing. Like now I'm affected. Like no one has answers. There still aren't really any answers right now. Mm-hmm. And it's like, how do we kind of create some sort of training or block of training or something where we can stay active? So that's kind of why I started the Spirit Talk. I'm like, well, if I, I have a bunch of friends in the industry, whether it's wildlife conservation, martial arts, domestic violence, um, people have gone after the cartels, stuff like that. I'm like, well, why don't I just kind of start doing my own thing where I can learn talking to my friends mm-hmm. and put content out there that other people can learn. Uh, and that's kind of what was there now. It's just, I've booked all the way through March with guests and- uh, You still are? Like you're booked yeah, now all the way through March? Yeah, and so, and I'll, I'll do breaking news now. One of my guests is launching in January is Eric Stolhansky, who played Rabbit and Super Troopers. Mm. Uh, and so we're going to be having a good talk about him playing fictional law enforcement. And he's got an awesome story because he actually has one leg and lot, not a lot of people know that. And uh, so we're, it's going to be great. So guests like that, um, that we can kind of have fun, learn, talk about stuff. And uh, that's kind of what I do. So I'm forever grateful for you guys um, letting me kind of branch out and kind of do that in a larger platform. Oh, it's awesome, dude. It's not a problem at all. And a pleasure to have you because it's educational. It's fun. It's interesting. It's a window into a world like personal protection. Doing what you do is a window into a world that that no one seems to understand. And what was interesting, if you if you jam Guariani is our guest, uh, John, uh, former Secret Service agent, is uh, a podcast called Spear Talk at DeanBlundell.com, wherever you get your fine podcasts as well. Um, you actually like you take protection to the next level a little bit because you were talking about animal conservation. Um, and I didn't know a lot of guys that went from like personal protection got into, you know, conservation as well. Like it, it's a fascinating sort of uh, industry because when you think about personal protection or when you think about bodyguards or you think about the kind of job that you're in, which is security and protection, you don't necessarily think about, you know, all the other aspects of protection when it comes to your job and what you do. Yeah. I mean, there's, you, you have security teams that protect the oil pipelines, assets uh or minerals like salt those salt mines and diamond mines and blood diamond I mean, all that stuff quartz mines they all have security because it's a, a something a, co- a commodity that everyone wants to have mm-hmm. when it comes to the wildlife stuff and another spirit talk i'm doing is with vet paw and basically they are an organization that works throughout africa that well if you're a veteran no matter what country you're from you get out you you have Everyone says PTSD helps with you have PTSD, animals help that. So they've combined it where you can get therapy protecting rhinoceroses, these animals that are being hunted and harvested, but by providing security for them in these big parks where these big game hunters are illegally going after the rhino horn, the ivory tusk of the elephant, and stuff like that. So, yeah, it makes you think. And that's kind of why I wanted to uh, talk to these people because I want to learn. I'm very fascinated by it. Who doesn't love animals? Mm-hmm. And stuff like that I mean, it's it's i think learning's awesome and to know that there's organizations out there that do this type of stuff it's whatever i can do to kind of help them i'm all for it uh john guanieri is our guest um spear talk is the name of the podcast it's at deanblundell.com uh the name of your company is called is it silver spear am i correct yeah silver spear security yeah and, and you guys do maritime security so that was because I was on your website this morning, I'm like, Jesus, these guys kind of do it all. They specialize in maritime security. But are you still doing like protection stuff, or is there because of COVID? Is it is it like fuck? You know. Take, yeah, take no, this protection stuff. I'm currently on. I've been on the road the last five months with Smiths and Buyers, which is the offset of Shine Down. Yeah. Doing the driving um, shows, and then in two weeks we start for two week run in the USA, um, doing more driving shows, outdoor shows, and three indoor shows. And so. On top of the normal advancing security stuff, whether it's hotels or the show, I had actually had to go back and get my COVID compliance certificate. So I am able to, I'm, legal, I'm certified to 
look at a venue or a location, be like, hey, what are we doing for social distancing, masks, sanitization, mm -hmm. it, stuff like that, temperature checks and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it's an added thing that um, I think a lot of people kind of, well, why do I got to do this? Well, hey, the, these are the times now either adapt or die. Yeah. And I chose to adapt. And um, so the protection stuff is it's still there. Um, what's fascinating is that we kind of look at this company as like a, a pizza. So you have bear time here. You might have tours, bodyguard stuff. You might have events. You might have award shows. Well, our, our smallest sliver has always been a state security. Well, once the riots started after George Floyd and stuff in certain areas, our state area security for high net worth people in Beverly Hills and California really picked up. And so we're able to kind of just move around pieces and parts just to kind of, so we're always kind of working. Mm -hmm. So it's been, it's been great. Yeah. Fuck. Uh, th talk about, you know, the, the, the process, like, you know, you used to uh, you toured obviously extensively with Nickelback for a long period of time, provided security for yep. those guys as well. You had, I think one of the guys from Nickelback on your show a couple of episodes ago too. Yep. Um, great guys, just super, super guys. If, if, yep. if you don't know, uh, the Kroger brothers and if you don't know, uh, the guys at Nickelback, they're like the most down to earth, salt of the earth cats. They really, really are. Um, do you do, do are you, here's a question, I guess <clears throat> when it comes to, um, you know, security and personal security now, uh, and you talk about a state security being, um, you know, the big thing for people, do, do you get like daily calls from people saying, Hey, listen, I'm fucking, we live in the weirdest time. I need some guys with guns outside my house. Or is it more of a, uh, like a, a planned approach when it comes to personal protection right now? No, we, um, the calls are nonstop. And uh, one of our clients is actually the Frank Zappa estate. And they've been with us for, with my CEO for 20 years. He grew up with Frank Zappa, Gail, and Dweezil, and Abit, and Diva. And so clients like that, that we, that might not necessarily not do security for 24 seven in the sense of like the traditional touring and stuff like that. But anytime there's an issue in California or, hey, there's a protest coming or there's an issue or there's been a, another shooting somewhere, God forbid, clients like that will always reach out. And so the last couple of months, we've really been working with the Zappa estate, um, helping them with certain um, issues they've had uh, with security and stuff. And, uh, but obviously word of mouth is huge. If you do a good job and you represent yourself and your company and like you have this moral compass that uh, people see that and people find value in you also pay what you get for. It. So if you put the time in, the effort and actually are you care about what you do, that makes a world of difference. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I come across people that in the say you're working in the hockey game uh, and the local security guy, whatever, base a couple hours a night doesn't really some of those people only work because it's a job they want the paycheck. Very rarely do you find the people that love their job and they treat it like their life and career. Mm -hmm. Those are the people I want to be associated with. And working with those types, that makes my job that much easier. So you used to be, <clears throat> your background, um, grew up in Massachusetts, uh, yep. which is where you live now. And and you decided that you wanted to get into personal security. Like what, what, what took you into the job you're now? Because I want to get to the seven and a half years you spent in the White House as a member of the Secret Service. But what, um, what, so what made I, you get into all this shit? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, if so, I, I always grew up like playing like the cops or robbers. I always loved like the um, watching movies like Robocop, Predator, uh, Missing in Action. So I always loved that the hero guy that takes out the bad guys. And so I always, I kind of fixated on, well, who could be like a really, who could be a good guy um, that can fight bad guys? So I'm like, well, either police or law enforcement or military. And so I decided to go to Norwich University, um, which is the oldest private military college in uh, the country. And I did four years of Naval ROTC. A lot of times people are like, well, why didn't you commission? Well, sophomore year, my dad had a brain aneurysm. It was in a coma. And my biggest fear was, hey, if I choose to um, commission or get sent somewhere, I can't be close to my mom and my sisters. And so I made the decision, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to not commission. I was still going to stay in the ROTC. I still love the military aspect. I did all four years of it, loved it. Reveille, every time there was TAPS. Every time there was whatever, everything military I did. And so junior year 2007, 
my buddy he graduated the year before and was doing on the motorcade unit uh, for the Secret Service and said he loved it. He's a big motorcycle guy. He's like, John, this is this is right up your alley. You get to do all this cool training and make a difference. And so um, I started the process and that process took over a year. Uh, background checks, every neighbor, every church you went to, every job you had, every any soccer player you played, any coach. The polygraph took about eight and a half hours over two days. And Holy <laughs> it's, <laughs> so, right. And so a lot of the times the questioning there's like 10 or 12 main questions like, hey, draw, like whatever, the basic stuff you'd probably get asked. Anyone would think you'd be asked. Yeah. Well, then they'll throw in stuff there like, uh, have you ever had sexual relations with an animal? Or ask these really ridiculous questions to get your mind. What'd you say? Thinking, what's that? What'd you say to the animal question? No. Oh, I was like, I was like, I was kind of like, what are you talking, what? And he's like, have you, I was like, no. <laughs> but so, but then they'll re-ask that question again. And you're kind of like, well, what? Then they hit you with, why did, if you find the drug, this money on the ground, what are you doing with the money if you find it? Like, they'll put you in these scenarios. Well, at three o'clock the first day, they're like, well, that's it. They're done. Like, we'll come back tomorrow morning at nine. And it, it, I did like two more hours that day, and then they basically had you passed. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, you have to get physically ready. Um, you have to pay a post exam, which is basically a basic law enforcement. Like you, you could take it right now and probably pass it because it's, it's basic. Mm -hmm. um, and then once you get there, you get down, set to, you go, you end up in Beltsville, Maryland, where you meet your class, you meet your instructors. Then they ship you down to Glencoe, Georgia for three and a half months where you're trading under the DHS umbrella with like Bureau of Prisons, ATF, DEA, uh, Capitol Police, Border Patrol, TSA. And so that three and a half months is very, you learn about law, the constitution, uh, Miranda rights, but you also get the firearm, pistol, MP5 training, uh, invasive driving, stuff like that, where it's very kind of open for that type of get your certifications for pistol and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, once you graduate there, and we, I think we only lost one or two people because of injury, because there's a lot of fighting, there's a lot of tactical stuff where you get hurt. Well, once you graduate there, you can set up the Beltsville, Maryland, which is the Secret Service specific training. And that's another three, three and a half months of everything very specific to Secret Service. Mm -hmm. Surviving a helicopter crash, um, I mean, you name it, where it's rope line stuff, evasive J turns with cars. So you're learning everything very specific to the Secret Service with mm -hmm. protection. And then I graduate that right after, right at the time Obama first got in. And then I served out till 2014. That last year, the last campaign in 2012, um, I was only home 30 days that year. And that was because of the nonstop campaigning. So our, the team, you, you, you jump around from between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama and vice versa, whoever the vice president was and stuff. And I, there's so many times I'd wake up and we travel on C5 or C17s with the motorcade stuff. And you kind of wake up, you don't know what city you're in. You're just so programmed to get the job done that you just get so numb to it. And that's kind of why um, I met my CEO at the time, Chris. And I'm like, hey, once I'm ready to get out, I feel burnt out in the sense of dealing with the, I guess, the politics slash whatever mm -hmm. in this world. I'd love to go private. And so that's kind of what I did in 2014. And I've been doing it ever since. Um, so seven and a half years of, of secret service, you go through all of that shit. <clears throat> How, what was your job, um, at the white house? Like what I know you had, you probably got ported to a bunch of different places. You said you wouldn't work with Romney. You and you had to go back to Obama. With all that other so stuff. basically you can, you control the access and flow. You're, I mean, you could be, out, you could be outside the West wing. You could be outside the oval office. You could be out on the South lawn, uh, different movements and stuff. There's always, you're also responsible for the treasury and the treasury guy at the time was like Timothy Geithner. Great guy, um, not to get the politics, but he was just a great guy. And then people like that, every time someone comes to the White House and stuff or leaves or state rivals with other world leaders, you're kind of, you're there. And every time there's a, an event that takes place, like say, um, Bin Laden, when he got killed, like, you, you get activated for certain stuff like that. And 
it's it was a very rewarding job. It was fun. There's you, I've I've met every single world leader or sports team that's gone through there. Um, it's just, yeah, it's it's it was a lot of fun, and I don't take anything for granted from it. Yeah. Well, I guess not. It's a job that not many people have that everybody wants to be inside. I always wondered, you know, when you get, you, you, they travel with uh, the, the presidential <clears throat> group travels with like yep. all their cars and shit. Um, yep. Do they, do they send that stuff ahead of time? Do they send the helicopter in the, in the, in the, in the Hercules as well? Like, is that uh, stupid um, fucking questions, but are you traveling in there? Is, does it suck to be on a plane for 14 hours straight heading overseas with your buddies? Like that kind of shit. Yeah, well, I'll tell you a funny story. We were we left from Andrews Air Force Base, the DC area, and we flew direct, or we flew, we had to get to Jakarta. And so you can imagine on a normal plane how long it is. And these things aren't going as fast. And it was like, you get up there sometimes and water's dripping on you, maybe oil. And you're like, uh, is this normal? The, the Air Force guy, yeah, this is great. Like, we don't worry about it. It's, this is what we do. And you kind of just sit back and laugh after the first time. You're like, man, this thing is a just whatever. But yeah, you travel with the beast, the limousine, any tactical type team or a piece of equipment you need. Um, if we are flying to a country, say like India or Israel, you are allowed your firearms, but they have to be carried to the Halliburton. And there's just certain protocols that change based on where you're flying and what you can bring in there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's you travel, and if you if he's jumping from city to city, there's one or two teams that will always jump ahead, um, almost like those big uh, concert tours, like U2, or they do those big arena the stadium stuff. There's always another unit going to the next city because you might get stuck here, and you can't always be. You have to. You can't rely on stuff you're using now. You gotta move ahead with it. So, mm. yeah, we. Uh, we uh, travel with it. No shit. Um, did you, obviously you met Obama several times, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah. The, uh, the problem, the, not the problem. The, a lot of times people are like, well, what was he like? It's like, well, every time you saw him, like he was great. Like there was never no drama. Like, and I'm not like, I never saw him. Of course you saw him dealing with politics, whether it was with meetings or speeches. Like I get that, but there was never a moment where you're kind of like, this guy's an asshole or now, I do think presidents have every right to be in that sense because there's so much going on that you and I, the media have no idea like what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And if someone's going to be an asshole, I, you would think it'd be the president, but he was, um, he was always great. Uh, Michelle was Michelle. The kids were great. Um, his mother was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, his staff was great. Like they, uh, Reggie Love was there. Cal Penn was there for a little bit. So people like that, that kind of like the, you would kind of see uh, the only one I really didn't um, get along with. Cause I think there was some arrogance there was Pete Souza, the white house photographer and his work is great, but he was always just very, just I'm who I am. It's like, dude, like, come on. Uh, but it is weird seeing when you see these guys would go on TV and even now, whether it's John Brennan or Hillary or something like that, mm -hmm. you're kind of like, man, I was that close to these people. Mm -hmm. um, and here's a story that my family loves at my Angelou's funeral. Obviously, everyone's there in DC. And I'm on what steps? Well, at the time, Hillary's Department of State, she is considered a clean asset in the sense of she does that everywhere she is, she doesn't have to be stopped. You don't have to check her belongings. Mm -hmm. But where the site was and how who she traveled with, we didn't know who she was with her. And so Puma, her aide, came up running with her to rush to the church. Mind you, my Andrew's body is 50 yards away, not even. Every person there, celebrities in town, and she's right up. The Department of State guys look at me, and they know. Like, I, they know I have to stop her. They're ready to start laughing because they know what's about to happen. So I let Hillary in. I stop Uma, and she's like, what are you doing? I go, you're not a clean, whatever. And I, I start, so she, she, she knows she's wrong. I start searching her. Literally 10 seconds later, I hear Hillary go, you know who the fuck she is. Let him in, let her in, you stupid cunt. <laughs> and, and there's three, three or four people there that heard it. And the Department of State guys are like, yikes. Do I fucking and everybody hates Hillary? It's because she's actually a bitch. She is, no, totally. I, that, if I could, and I don't ever want to slander politicians. Like, I, I get it. Like, I'm not, but 
there is a decency and a there's a level of respect you have to show to every band and woman. And that day, I read that I was like, man, this woman. Of the, the irony too that bothered me was that Maya Angelou was right there. Yeah, it's at her and, funeral. <laughs> right, and you're kind of like, are you serious? And so she walks in, like whatever, like nothing happened. Like I, obviously, I was to the right. I'm and, impressed that that the the lady who almost uh, won the presidency of the United States called someone a cunt. It, it, yeah, well, yeah. There's you. There's a lot of stories out there like that, and. Uh, she, uh, yeah, I was the, the, talking to the Department of State guys after. We're kind of like, man, I don't know how you took, I don't know how you took that. Cause she almost like was just like so douchey and so like you, you're just here for the photo op. Then if you if you're calling me a cunt outside, probably one of the greatest, most prolific, awesome women, human beings, and I, at what, her fucking you, what, funeral, right? Yeah. And so. <laughs> That stuff like that happens where you're kind of like, man, I'm kind of soured on these people. Yeah. And of course, the media's they're there, but they're only they're only that if that clip ever got out. They'd be like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> well, dude, dude, I think everybody knows that she's a you know a carpetbagger. That's yeah. that's that's the issue. And so that takes us to obviously the new press. Do you still have friends that are uh, doing secret service I do. for the new press? Yeah. I do. Uh, Any of them? Guys are snipers, um, stuff like that. They're I mean they. They love it. I mean, I I don't fathom. I, if a lot of times people ask me, "Hey, if you could go back, would you be a cop right now?" I'm like, man, I don't know. Like, I know so many people with this whole defund the police movement, and now right or wrong, whether this incidents like George Floyd, like we can all agree that guy should have died, whatever. Mm -hmm. But this movement to defund and stuff, it's like you realize these men and women are putting their lives on the line to protect you and do your thing and to deal with that, especially in areas like the white house where you have Antifa or other groups that are throwing Molotovs or throwing gas canisters and the media will talk about it. But I mean, I've seen videos and pictures from my friends that work there. I mean, it's the back in a couple months ago, it's a war zone. Same mm -hmm. as Seattle, my friends in the Seattle PD, the chop zone, you know, it's done. These people, the people are literally getting maimed and murdered here. And, and so, you can't, you kind of, you kind of like, man, I hats off to you guys for keep doing it, what you're doing now, because I don't know if I would enjoy it as much, mm -hmm. but someone has to do the job. You're not there for politics. You, you take a bullet for that man or girl, whoever you're protecting, and there's no hesitation about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is weird, right? Because the, you know, the guy that's in there now, although he stands up for uh, the police, um, and I think misguided, you know, misguided way. It's not like a learning thing, you know, like but Biden, to his credit, has said, listen, I don't want to defund the fucking police. We just need to educate some, a few different policemen and and we need to get the fuck out of our own ways, which which is what I like to hear. But um, in regards to what you're saying, um, watching all the melee and watching all the bullshit for the past four years is it harder protecting a guy like Trump than it was protecting a guy like Obama who, you know, nickname, no drama, Obama. Yeah. I mean, he chain smoked a lot. Uh, that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> uh, the no, yeah, yes. And no more. So back, back when I was there, I mean, there was bomb threats at the white house every day or every other day. There was people jumping on the fence side. There was threats. Uh, hey, quick question, quick question. I, Obama's new book just came out, and he was talking about how it was his first year inauguration, there was an actual bomb threat um, on the South Lawn. There was, or there was, like, where he was doing his inauguration. He was taking... In the, there, yeah. yeah, there was a bomb threat. So he had a speech ready to tell everybody to clear the fuck out. Um, did, did you hear anything about that? Um, no. Um, and, it's, and the reason I say no is I don't... They happen so... They happen a ton. Of, they happen a lot there. So, just I, bomb me, threats at the there. White House happen all there. the time. Yes, yes. And so, there's like how many a month? Calls. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to get too specific in terms of like what the procedure is, but you probably get you probably you probably over a half a dozen, fifteen or so a month. Still to this day. Yep, and a lot of the times, it's one of those things where you can't have to take every threat. Um, serious and there is a protocol like how you how you kind of get the information you need from the caller or if you can trace them and stuff like that but if it's not a bomb threat it's 
after 9-11, they had the FAA shut down restricted airspace. So nothing can fly within a certain radius around the White House, whether it's drones, kites, hot air balloons, even airplanes, because you got Reagan flying in there and uh, DWI, the airport there. Um, and so there's been times where helicopters will lose transmission or airplanes, private planes will kind of lose radio. And we're bunkering down the White House because you, you don't know they're about to get shot down. You don't know what's going on. So you're always ready. You train for that stuff. Mm -hmm. And fence jumpers, that, that's now it's probably picked up in the sense that there's so much a civil angst and hatred spewed between both lines. And it's kind of like, so in that sense, yeah, there's a lot because a lot of people hate the current president but a lot of the same number of people like the current president. So there's that divide where you're kind of operating there. But I mean, I, all my their hats off to them. They're doing a great job. And the Secret Service isn't political. Mm -hmm. So we, there's, a, there's rules where, hey, say, say Dean is a Democrat, or say Dean's a Republican, I'm a Democrat. We're good friends, but we're driving into park at the White House. Dean's not gonna have a Trump sticker. I'm not going to have a bias sticker on my car. You're not allowed. We can't show sides. Mm -hmm. And part of that thing is it's because you just, you, you, your goal is to do your job, make sure everyone goes home safe, do the right protocol. And you're protecting the leader of the free world and his assets and staff. And there, there should not be politics with that because mm -hmm. it's your job. So, so why is there now? Uh, John Guarnieri is our guest, host of Spear Talk. He was Secret Service for Obama for several years. He also runs a uh, protection service company called Silver Spear. Uh, Spear Talk's the name of the podcast, available at DeanBlundell.com. Um, this transition. Now, you, I don't know if you're a part of the Obama transition from Bush to Obama. Maybe you, you got there a little bit. I'm not too sure. But um, this this whole thing now, Trump is holding up the the transition what is this what does this all fucking mean like what is it like to be a part of that and what should be happening um right now in terms of secret service they don't change based on who's president um you don't swap out who's currently in the white house with who's currency there um so basically you you don't you're not based on the only thing that really changes is that trump will have his team for a set number of years um, and then Obama was actually the president, I believe, that, um, hey, for seven years or something like that, you carry Secret Service protection for the first family. And then after seven years, it's on you, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, you'll have certain people, whether the job they put in for, hey, I want to be the team leader for Trump as he transitions out, or I want to stay with team Obama, I want to be with him, I'll be his agent in charge for his unit thing. Um, so we'll do that. But in terms of the actual change, there's no changeover. No one is switching out or we're going here. Uh, different opportunities will arise where if there is a transition and nor, like, nor, I mean, I, I, try, I, don't, I don't like talking politics because it gets me all fired up, but uh, normally you don't really deal with, if there's a transition, which no matter what, there will be a transition in terms of one president leaving, or one president staying, one president coming, whatever happens, there is a transition where another team is established to help with that transition. Mm -hmm. Now, people will talk about, oh, you're going to have to march by the White House. That's never going to happen. If he loses or whatever, whatever, because there's so much crap out there right now, I don't know what to believe. Mm -hmm. But no matter what happens, no one's getting marched out. That's not going to happen. No one is, if you, if you lose, you lose. You win, you win. Mm -hmm. So, but in terms of the scope of the Secret Service, there is, they're not, they're not going to be involved in either one of that. I know people that were on the Trump uh, team now, and they love him. They love him, and this, half those people worked with Obama in the last year. They loved him. Loved him. So, I don't think there's any going to be an issues in terms of the Secret Service um, getting involved. Like, there's no sides. Mm -hmm. Like, this is your career. You put 20 years in, and I will. St like, one of those things, though. I don't know if you, I think you, I think you had mentioned it on your show or you posted about it, but there was this thing that came out where these when Trump after he beat COVID did a motorcade with, with um, agents in the car, or whatever. Now, mind you, those cars are sealed where no gas can get in or like nothing's going to happen to that those cars. And people were like, "He's putting these Secret Service guys in harm's way. They're all there. He's not." 
wearing a mask. He just be he just had COVID. Well, in the video, like all the agents had masks on. They're tested every day, and if masks don't work, if they do work, then why are you worried about spreading? And here's the other thing no one talks about. If I'm still working there, if I'm willing to literally get hit by a grenade or shot in the head to protect the president, the last thing I'm worried about is COVID. Like you're, you, your life is to serve what your job is mm -hmm. and you have to serve. Now, so even if even if these guys like let me let me say this, let's say pre existing condition, Secret Service guys like can you can you beg out of the job like when Trump wanted to do that wheelie in his car out of the hospital? Could the Secret Service yeah, guys no, in the front go, listen, I I'm not comfortable with this because you're sick as fuck. No, it's, it's uh, yeah, that's one of those things where obviously there is so you're never going to be short if put it this way, there's never going to be the required number of Secret Service on him at all times. Now different stuff pops up. So there's been instances where, hey, if my wife's pregnant and about to give birth, or we have a family member, parent staying at our house, hey guys, hey shift leader, can I do, no problem. Like you're never forced into a situation where. It's not it, unflinching. It it's like you, you, you have, it's like a fucking job, right? Like where you can go, hey, listen, right. I've got a birthday party. My mom's sick. She's living with us. I can't really do this gig. Can you push me over here? They're like, yeah, no problem, buddy. It's no, no yeah. and that's, and we talked about it off air before this is that I, I personally hate wearing a mask. I, I'm never sick. I guarantee I had it on those cruise ships. I was asymptomatic. But here's the thing I wear it because I have a sick father. I know people that are dealing with issues where, this is this is bigger than me now and so i care about those people mm -hmm. not that i don't care about myself and you're not going to see me out there pro like when this, when this first started the supermarkets and follow this arrow and put your mask on and don't stare at a person i'm, I'm kind of like this is bullshit so that was my anger but when you sit back hey i got a sick father and so if i see someone out in public i'm not going to chastise them mm -hmm. they're going to do what they do and I would do what I all I can do to protect the people I love and friends and protect other people that might be in the situation I'm in. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know what? And you couldn't have fucking be more right in my eyes. You know, I, I've, I've said this many times before is I think the, the world has been segmented into three groups of assholes, the middle, which is us. Uh, and then the alt right and the alt left and all the bullshit that comes from either sides and the extremism and forcing their opinion or their narrative on us is a joke. And I'm very much pro PPE. I, I want people to wear masks, uh, but I'm not, I'm like you where if someone's not wearing one in a grocery store and they're putting up a fucking stink, I'm not tackling the guy to get a mask on him. And no, I, I'm, I, I'm walking right. as far around that guy as I can. So I can get my cheese. I can get my meats. I can get my fruit loops and I can get the fuck out of there. That's, that's right. how I feel about this whole thing to the point where I'm, I'm considering coming up with this group, an alt middle group where we just don't give a shit as much as you give a shit. So um, that's that's my opinion. And, and you're seeing it ruin different industries and ruin different, uh, like the thin blue line. I have never in my life, because I've always had this real serious appreciation for men and women who stand in front of bullets and tack gear so we don't have to. That's just how right. I feel, right? So I'm, I'm, right. I'm forever in debt to the men and women in uniform still, people who have lost their lives in the past, people who fought in world wars, people that made the ultimate sacrifice. So watching you being in this industry now, watching the militarization and the weaponization of different groups, telling you that there's something wrong with your industry, that's got to fucking suck. Yeah, it's, it's funny because the entertainment industry uh, was the first kind of industry shut down. It, uh, it's looking like it'll be the last one to come back. Now, I know sports are doing their thing, but... They're talking of second wave and shut like whatever, and so yeah. There's I know there's a lot going on behind the scenes, and like I said, I'm out there right now and doing stuff where I'm very fortunate. My job is a necessary job at the time. I know a lot of people that are techs, or our good friend Hoogie is affected by this because he can't actually can't go out there, mm -hmm. and I sympathize with them. I get it, and I, it pisses me off. But it, it for me. To, to know that I'm out there trying to make a difference. Other people I know that are, I would not, love nothing more than for all of our brothers and sisters to be back on tours together and stuff. Mm -hmm. There has to be a safe way to do it. But my issue is at least have that conversation. It runs into some scenarios, come up with ideas. Just don't, just don't accept the fact that COVID's still here and there's no answers. Like we could create plans. We could be proactive towards it. And 
like you, I don't think you're, I don't think you were just accepting COVID. Like, I think you were just kind of like, well, okay, it's here. What can I do in my role to help alleviate the situation? If, if everyone thinks that way, mm-hmm. I think we're headed in the right direction. Um, as, as someone with the perspective that you have <clears throat> and rumor of another lockdown maybe coming uh, to the United States, obviously the Biden presidency, he's, you know, he's been unabashed about saying, listen, we need to start wearing masks and we'll look at every opportunity. Um, what do you say to like that fucking idiot that still thinks it's a hoax um, that values because I don't understand Americans from this perspective, value the ability to wear a mask and the freedom to wear a mask? Uh, over the actual life that they're living. Like they're, the freedom to be able to put that thing on or not is somehow more valuable to most Americans, or 72 million Americans is what it seems like, um, than, than their actual life itself. Can you fucking explain that to me in a way that yeah. I understand? And it's a great question because every day I think about it. it you got 11 million people with the infection. You got 260,000 dead. You'll do another 170,000 infections today. So explain. I that. do think I do think where the the angst and the hate and the the middle finger to um, go, big government for pushing for shutdowns is the fact that I the, I don't think you could argue the virus isn't real. Like obviously it's a real thing. I have resentment towards the fact that the mitigation and the propaganda behind it is an issue. And, and like we talked about too, it's like. The media or the alt right or alt left will weaponize this pandemic or virus, whatever you want to call it, to fit their agenda. Mm-hmm. And then, when, as you and I are in the middle, you hear one side say, "Well, based on the CDC and the WHO, the numbers of recovery after only affect people really if you're like 72 or higher. Everyone else has a 99.6667 percent recovery rate, which is fact, which is on the whatever the website is. I don't even know what facts are. CDC." Anymore. So you see, but then you have the other side. It's like, well, it's so you're, you're kind of just like, I get it. Like, yes, I think the virus is real. It's here. The people that don't like the backtracking of the WHO or CDC every two days or someone like Dr. Fauci or Brexit, they'll come out and say masks are good, masks are bad, masks are good, social distancing. Hey, if you get two days ago, Fauci's like, well, if you have the vaccine, you still have to wear a mask and social distance. Well, which one is it? Because it went from... 15 days to slow the spread to here we are almost a year later. And I think that's where the resentment comes in. And and I agree with you too. It's like the people that are so defiant in that resentment, you still have to acknowledge the fact that it's a real virus. Mm-hmm. And so you protesting the virus or I'm not wearing a mask, like you're, now you're being selfish. You're not caring about other people that might not agree with you. I'm not saying, I, man, if you want to think that way, I will gladly take a bullet for you. I will defend your right to think that way. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean you can start calling me names or pick a fight with me because I think differently than you. It's, it's, a whole, it's a really interesting case study that is always changing. It, it, it's, it, like you, I sit back and like, man, what are you people saying? What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's You'll frustrating. Have to be- it's right. frust- it's frustrating because you know I I hear someone like you that's got seven and a half years in the Secret Service protecting Barack Obama go I don't fucking know anymore like you know someone that's been that close to the president and where all the answers are he should probably know so the fact that you're confused is such a great fucking example to set for everybody to tell everybody where we are which is really simple and 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 I I look at it from from a couple of different perspectives but I always come back and I grind down to these very few things which is give me the fucking baseline truth from a reasonable source just give 100%. me that let me give me the baseline truth reasonable source and then I am going to do what I need to do to keep my family safe to keep me safe so I'm not perpetrating this disease so I'm not shedding this disease so I'm not unwillingly passing this on to somebody else because I do believe in science and I and and that's the part that fucking makes me laugh the hardest when I see numbers come out of the states and it's all it's like a it's like a laugh that but it's almost a crying laugh which is like hard to imagine that someone and we live in Canada your girlfriend lives in Canada. You've probably been to Canada a million times. Um, you know, we're the people that ordered the soup. They gave us the steak. We didn't complain, and we fucking ate it anyway. Um, but right. in America, it's like, and, and to Canada to a lesser extent, these certain groups just won't shut the fuck up and stop telling us 
how it is and what to do because of how it is based on no information or some fucking stupid meme they read from a QAnon site. That's the part that I, and, 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 it, and, it, and I'm serious. Like these people are making life decisions. I saw a guy from QAnon on, on, on television, rush into a fucking pizzeria, rush into a pizzeria, like a family pizzeria to save t- 15 kids that were being sexually abused in the basement because of QAnon. And, and the proliferation of information like that into these malleable, stupid minds, uh, and then how that gets fed into our ecosystem, I find, and you said a case study, I think it is awesome. It's awesome to the, to the point where it's now making guys like you and me who don't, listen, we got the answers we want, we're happy living the way we live, to look for more answers. And I found answers in, go fuck yourself, everybody else. I'm going to do what I got to do. I'm taking this fucking seriously. But on mass trying to understand how America doesn't seem to grasp that this is as big a deal as it is based on their individual freedoms to own a gun or to have an abortion or whatever it is. It blows my mind on a daily basis because by and large, most countries and the citizens of those countries affected have gotten at least the fact that this is fucking serious. Yeah, no, it all goes back. I think we do have to, if we all act as a role model for someone else or at least try to do the right thing. I think that's going to help people because people should be afraid to find that role model or someone that, Hey, like this person's saying something cool. Like, Hey, if I, if I'm nobody and I hear Dean right now talking, I'm going to be like, Oh, that guy actually, I lied with him. Like he's, he's got a voice. People know who he is. And I can kind of lie to that. Maybe I, maybe I can start thinking like he does. And so we have to hold each other accountable just to move forward. Um, and again, there's no, it's, it's crazy because no one is, I mean, the, the, the thing, and we can jump into this, the Q stuff, I love a good conspiracy. I am all about Bigfoot, Elliot Nass, JFK, Elvis. If you want to give me uh, uh, drinking the blood of children, I, I'll go down those rabbit holes. I'll have those talks. Not necessarily because I believe all of them, but I am fascinated with that there is this other story. Where I do get mad is that just because someone's in QAnon or Q or they are uh, Black Lives Matter, Antifa, or whatever organization that people have an issue with, don't censor them. I don't like the fact that if someone thinks differently, you get censored, whether it's on social media or just life in general. Um, I think we can all agree that if you are a racist or a homophobe or someone that there is no redeeming quality, like you're just a piece of shit, censor that look i don't want i don't want david duke from the kkk telling me that oh you vote for my kid like i don't need you to tell me who to vote for. like just shut up mm-hmm. but the idea of censorship is is that a fear this is a question for you is that a fear for you to be the raw authentic you that there could be someone that wants to censor you a la the poppy story or something out where what the other day you talked about Trudeau wanted to do the, the great reset. Mm-hmm. Are you afraid to talk about subject matter that could get people scared to be like, why is he talking about that? Why is he, why is he acting? Why is he picking a side? Is that, is that a fear for you? No. Uh, and I'll tell you why, because for the last three years I've operated under the assumption that listening is the best policy right now. Yes. Uh, because we've been going through this evolution of a, a, as a people, as a society, as, as we've been trying to re-understand the really important things. And I had this conversation to someone the other day. I feel like <clears throat> I could be wrong, but I feel like, and I, it, to the point where it's like one of the truths that I live by, I feel as if um, my job now is to give common sense a little bit of an enema. I feel like my job is to present people with facts, allow people to fucking go after those facts if they like, but also to point out, make fun of, and shame the people that do it in a really fucking hateful way. You talked about the David Dukes of the world. I'm I'm of the opinion that the freedom of speech is one of the most important uh, freedoms we can uphold. However, the freedom of hate speech is not. The freedom, the freedom of division and hate speech and the division that comes from hate speech is not. So when, when someone says, fuck Facebook, I should be allowed to be as racist as I want. The Proud Boys should be allowed to further their Nazi agenda. I can't believe you guys took my fucking account away. Well, fuck, I can. That's hate speech. You're not allowed to do that in real life. You shouldn't be allowed to do it on the fucking web. And I think that transferably, those things should be mutually exclusive. I really do. I think if you, if and, and so I don't engage in that. So that's not a real worry for me as far as freedom of speech. 
And and I think that the freedom of speech that those guys are talking about is different than the ones you and I are discussing. We're, right. we're talking the about the commonplace right. of ideas. We're not talking about forcing an agenda or a narrative that's dangerous and hurtful that might kill somebody down a whole group's throat. That's what we're talking about. Right. I got asked the other day, like, t- kind of talked about this, and someone's like, well, those groups that hate gay people, like, if, they, if there's a group that says, I hate homosexuals, you're going to hell, God says you're a faggot. Christians. Those people right there should be put in a hole and literally buried alive. Yeah. Now, if your group is about, hey, I'm Catholic, I don't, I don't agree with homosexual marriage, it's a sin, I'm okay, like, I'm okay with it. I, I, I get it. Like, you are, this is your religion, but you're not out there saying, fuck gay people, kill them all. Like you're not, there's a fine line between the freedom of speech. And when people kind of take that for granted and take advantage of that, that's when those people on left or right should literally be silenced. And it's it's disheartening that people like that usually have the loudest voice, right? Mm-hmm. And with, every time one of, they, one of them barks, you always have the reaction from the other side and we get caught in the middle and it's just kind of like, guys, girls, like, what are we doing here? Like, it's okay to disagree. I'm all for disagreement, healthy discussion, arguments, but don't swing a fist and don't be calling each other names just because mm-hmm. they think differently. Quick question. Um, you know, the Antifa Proud Boys uh, fights that we've seen go on, the one in D.C., uh, yes. you know, the, 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 the block that they had uh, sectioned off in Seattle, uh, in Oregon as well, importantly. It, a part of like, cause you're a young dude, what you're in your early thirties is, is part of you. Like when you saw that action, were you like, fuck, I wish I could get in there. <laughs> um, yeah, no. So I would not be partaking of the chop. I would not be growing tomatoes on a tarp on a basketball court in Seattle. <laughs> now when I see, and it's a fire, it's one of those things too. Cause like those people think they want their defense. They're, they're, mis- they're reading the Constitution or whatever. They think their rights are whatever their rights are. Well, those people at CHOP, they're talking about, oh, we hate Trump because he shut down the border. We want open borders. Well, the first thing they did was deploy a border with roadblocks and guys that are armed. And so the hypocrisy of that whole situation is a joke. Yeah. Now, do I have the urge to want to go in there with my Second Amendment rights and lock and load with my my brothers and sisters blasted whatever letters scared music and just fighting for America. No, but I do have a sense of, I'm not going to say American pride, but I, I do like that. I don't like the fact that we are in a situation where you have U S citizens going against each other mm-hmm. just because of some bullshit idea that neither political party really gives a shit about you or I. Mm-hmm. And the minute you start putting violence and gun, like it just, it makes me sad. I do like the people defend the constitution and want to hold people accountable. Now there are legal means to do that. But for me to get hyped up and it's crazy. And my friend that was Seattle PD would send me pictures and stuff. And I'm just like, man, why isn't the stuff with the news? He goes, well, it's not going to get out because it's going to show what, how one side really is. And it's like, man, it makes me so bad that that, that stuff like that's allowed to happen. Mm. yeah it's weird right like if you don't you and i are on the a sports team and we don't we're not playing or we hate the code we're not you and i are going to start our own team just because we don't like maybe we suck (laughs) so (laughs) take that maybe dean and i are not good on this team we're not going to start our own team because we're going to have a team full of losers just work together to kind of play as a team not create your own that's why you speak for your own fucking team My, my team's full of winners dude Winners. (laughs) Winners. <laughs> I only I only have teams full of fucking winners. Uh John Guanieri is our guest. Silver Spear is the name of his company. Uh personal protection, maritime protection. Uh we're talking a little bit about fucking everything from transitioning from one president to the other. Uh your time in the Secret Service. I'd be I'd be stupid to not ask you a couple of really stupid questions though. Like it'd be one of the cause because you you've been close to the ring. You've been close you 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 know shit. Do you guys have stuff as Secret Service that you're sworn? Because a buddy of mine that worked for the Canadian government for years, I'm like, tell me about this. And he's like, I can't sworn to secrecy. I still, like, for the rest of my life, I can't tell you any. Yeah, of there's, there's stuff um, like protocol procedures. Yeah, that stuff might change, but there's specific stuff and information you know about people um, that you can't talk about or the, the location of certain assets. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think the rule is. 
if you're going to write a book or do like a TV show thing, you have to wait 20 years um, after you retire or something weird like that. I'm not going to write a Like, I don't care enough to write a book about that side of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but people that, yeah, as long as you're talking about stuff that's general knowledge, uh, now specific stories, as long as there's no like, like secret stuff, like Hillary calling me a cunt. Like that, you're fine with that. It's the stuff. It's I think it's stuff. funny that she called you a cunt because you you checked uh, Huma Abedin. I think that's her name. Yes, and and, yep. and that was right about the time her husband uh, Anthony Weiner, one of the greatest well, stories of all time, was was busted for sending pictures to underage girls. Right. Yeah. That that had just come out a couple of weeks later. I think. Too. Well, it's oh, you're the like, whole thing. Were you like this? Oh, crying shame. That's a shame. Right. <laughs> Where's the news now? Yeah. No. It's you're right. Um. Yeah, I mean, there's no... There's, like, okay, there's so do stuff. aliens exist? Have you been to Roswell? Are you allowed to talk about that? Um, what, in the sense, well, if you've noticed the last couple of months, they've declassified a lot of that stuff, the military. Um, but were you and, around, like, did you get to see any of this shit? What, Roswell or Area 51? Uh, I mean, do you know if aliens exist? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I have my beliefs. There's other stuff. Yeah, but beliefs, m- uh, beliefs, mishmifs, uh, John. I don't really care about beliefs. I, I, I want never, concrete I have evidence. Never, I have never seen an alien. I've never met Dr. Oaken from Independence Day in the lab okay. saying, release me. <laughs> um, now, the other, I do have a guest coming on um, end of December where Dr. Stephen Greer, he's probably the premier ufologist in the world. And we talk about stuff that's – he's got two documentaries that just came out. But if you're into, like, the UFO type yeah. stuff, that's – the recent declassification from the military branches of the government, it's pretty It's pretty crazy that they chose to redact a lot of that stuff now in the middle of a pandemic because no one gives a shit. Mm-hmm. And like any other year, you'd be like, what the hell? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because we. I just want to know. It's like one of those little things I'm like, okay, fuck, take the top off the bottle. Let's figure out what we got, what we're dealing with here as far as aliens. Uh, worst world leader that you've had to deal with? Oh, God. Uh, Give me a few if you uh, l- l- light them up right now, John. So no people, fucking reason why you I, shouldn't. People I've, people I've met that I loved, uh, and this isn't people I've had dinner with, like people I've interacted with. That Yahoo, incredible. Good dude. Uh, yep. The Pope at the time, great. Which Pope? Uh... Uh, what was the one before the current Benedict? One? Benedict, yeah. He seems he uh, like he, he, he seems like he's a he's like a fucking horror movie character. That guy. Yeah. Well, we uh, I always and I, obviously I'm Catholic, so I, I revere and I love. That, we're not going to talk about that scandal. Like, there's issues there, but mm-hmm. I some of that pot like position, like I learning about the history of the popes and stuff. Like, it's always blew my mind. But looking at him, I'm like, this guy looks like a Bond villain, like some evil like Joel Olstein meets. <laughs> That idiot uh, guy you guys keep posting about with that stupid Biden laugh. Like that cross. Oh, uh, uh, Kenneth Copeland. Jesus. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the great. Um, Fucking crazy you met a Pope. Was it, what, did, uh, you, did you shake his hand? Are you allowed to touch the Dalai Pope? Dalai Lama, I met. You met the Dalai uh, Lama? Yeah, when he came. Is he like just uh, a ray of sunshine to be around? I, I I picture him to be like the kind of guy you want to hang out with all day Saturday in the park. Yeah, like you, you look at him, you're kind of like, man, this guy's probably really good at cornhole or ladder ball. Like he's got <laughs> that, he's got like that, like that vibey kind of like lives on the beach. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's people, what's fascinating for me, they all have this aura because there's, there is such a limelight um, that you're kind of, like, it's cool to be near these people. Mm-hmm. Now, would I love to have a conversation with all these guys? For sure. Uh, a funny story. I really haven't told this one a lot, but it kind of ties into what I do now. Uh, back in, every September is the United Nations in New York City. So all the world leaders in. Well, one year, I am responsible. I'm working at the Mandarin Oriental the Hotel. And I'm responsible on one floor for watching, I believe it's the leader, the president is not entourage of the Ivory Coast, Ghana, and some other country in that area. Yeah. Well, like when they come in here, they get full whatever they want. So they go all shopping at Macy's, like it's it's nonstop. Like this is, they're using their country's money illegally to 
do whatever they want, like the free range. So they're all, they're basically sovereign wherever they are in our country. We're watching them, making sure whatever. And one of the leaders, he's just there. Half these people are no clothes on, walk around this hotel floor, like they it's like like this is their home. Well, we one of the rooms where they left, they actually what looked like a sacrifice, whether it was goat or chicken in the uh, bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they just very weird. And one of the rules for us is that we can't accept money, obviously. Now, and I'm, I'm not talking bribes. I'm talking where, hey, after that one detail, I'm in the stairwell with one of their guys, one of like their handlers. And he's like, hey, he wants to give you this watch. It looked like a gold Rolex, like legit. And I can't take it. Like anything over a certain number of money, whether it's like I think a cup of coffee or like something like that where you're not influenced. Yeah. I'm like, hey, I, I can't take it. No, he insists, take it. I didn't take it, but they have no concept of, like, we're not corrupt. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't, they're kind of fascinated. Well, either way, so that same trip, I'll back up like two days. Well, I think we're on like the 14th floor or something like that. Well, the, the lobby was, I think, somewhere close to there. Well, I've been watching the elevator bay. The elevator bay opens up. It's... Sherry Moon Zombie and Rob Zombie and Chad Crow were Nickelback. They were in New York City at the time. I believe they're both on Roadrunner Records at the time. This would have been 2008, 2009, 2010. They both walk off the elevator. They, they see me, but they're kind of like, they think they're in the lobby. Well, they start walking on the lobby, walking down up the lobby. Hey, guys, obviously I knew who they were because I'm a music guy, and you guys can't be here. Like, whoa, what's up? But you guys are on the wrong floor. Lobby's down a couple of floors. Like, oh, sorry about it. And that's actually the first time I met Chad Kroger. And I'll be honest to him. Like, we left about now that I would be their security director years down the road. Yeah. Yeah, you were for but like... Pe pe people are dumb to what's going on. Like, yeah. it's funny, other celebrities, unless they're in their own little world, like, you're in the middle of United Nations. Literally, there could be explosion. There could be garbage going everywhere. And you're just completely aware to, oh, cool fascinating just part of your job is just part of what you do like it, it, seeing that every day which is why i wanted to know who the worst leader was I, I i would see i would say like i don't know if you've met putin but i i bet you like in a room he's, he's probably pretty fun to be with <laughs> yeah i i get i don't know if that's the media painted one side of him i don't know and so like you always kind of like man this is an evil guy but is he though so i like i i wish and i'd have to go down a rabbit hole kind of dig about him and stuff and try to figure out um, another story, and I, I'll be quick. The one year at the United Nations, we were at the Waldorf Astoria, and it's your, who was your prime minister before uh, Trudeau? Uh, Stephen Harper. And what year did he get out? Mm, I'm going to say six, seven years ago. Right. Yeah. You're trying to, well, either way, he came through, obviously, when they come in, there's magnetometers and security protocol. Yeah. He kind of zoomed in like went straight up the alley. Well, people outside knew who it was. He's not going to get stopped, swept, like whatever. Well, I see from the corner of my eye because I'm dealing with something else and I kind of put my arm out and grab him. I go, man, what are you doing? I see his lapel pin, like, oh, crap. He's like, hey, man, you just do the job. And so that's kind of what I interacted with him. Well, later that night, um, you, Bono was there and maybe Madonna, people like that, they're into the politics. Biden, or Biden, uh, Bono's up at the lobby area at the Waldorf, drunk or drinking, uh, playing on the piano with a bunch of world leaders. And so stuff like that, you see, you're kind of like, this is cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, Harper, so, yeah. He, I liked Harper. He's, yeah, you know what? A lot of people hate him because he's conservative, but he, he was actually a really great prime minister. He was like... Well, I just don't know his politics. I, for him, though, like, he, like, we'd see each other the rest of the week. He'd be like, hey, do you need a coffee? And I'm like, dude, this is the prime minister of Canada who I don't know outside who he is, like the politics, but this is like a, this is a guy that gets it. Like yeah. I obviously people didn't like him or don't like him, but he's still a human being and the interaction I had with him stuff, people like that. I, I will always be grateful for. Yeah. You know what he, uh, to a man. And if you talk to people, I know people that know him. I've never met the guy, but everybody says the same thing. He was as about a straight shooter as they got pretty down to earth, pretty low key, just really conservative and had those religious conservative views, which this country fucking abandoned. Um, years ago. So it, tough for him, but I, I get it. Like it, it's weird. You know, when you talk to guys like you that have had these experiences, like everyday experience, you say, no one knows what's, what goes on inside. 
Like you would never expect there to be a ritual sacrifice on the 14th floor of the Waldorf Asteria during UN week. Um, but like, you know, being able to see those things, go in and see how other people operate. That's fucking fascinating. If you're a learning person, you would love that job. Right. It's awesome. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I definitely get, I, I take nothing for granted. I love the time there and, I am forever grateful to the experiences. Well, I uh, appreciate you you coming on and, and explaining um, a whole bunch of stuff to us uh, and telling us some stories about your time. And And even though you're in America, I want to thank you for your service because servicemen and women deserve that. And uh, you deserve yeah, that as you. well. So I uh, appreciate it. And your fucking podcast is great. Real quick, before we let you go, uh, Sergeant Frank Wood sent me a DM yesterday because I followed him. And I know he's going to be on your podcast soon. Yeah, the uh, I did. I recorded that yesterday, and so I like to record like a month ahead because I'm going on a two week tour coming up. I like to have stuff stored, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna tell you what, James Burns is one badass dude. So we kind of break down that character from Call of Duty, and yeah, he's like, the voice of Call of Duty, Frank's Frank, yeah, Frank Woods. I showed Woods, my Frank kids, Woods. so he DM me yesterday. I'm like, hey guys, Frank Woods just sent me a fucking DM, and they're like, oh my god, it's unbelievable! I can't believe it. And show like taking screen grabs of it and shit. Yeah, so no, it's he, fucking it's, awesome. It's, it's gonna be. Uh, it was a great talk, and he played the stories. He he actually won a national championship in Belgium. He played in the NHL for a little bit too, and so you hear about all these stories. And it's like it, it, people like that are just cool because people know who he is. But I like talking about stuff that. Yeah, we talk about the video game and that character and the training for it, but we talk about other stuff too, like current political issues and everything going on. It's, that's a great one. Mm. I'm looking forward to it and if you haven't downloaded the podcast do it it's called Spear Talk it's from Silver Spear uh, Protection Services John Guanieri you can follow him on Twitter and Instagram where are your socials as well can you give me those real quick Uh, Instagram is John Silver Spear one word obviously Uh, Twitter is Silver Spear 44 Uh, Facebook I I, I actually really hate Facebook it's a necessary evil so I don't really (laughs) Just uh, Google advertise Facebook. that. So, Silver Spear. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I, I'm of the same opinion. We have like a few thousand people that follow us on Facebook, and I still don't have a password to that fucking platform. Because yeah. It's, you, you're better off not even having no, it. I'm good. I don't need it. <laughs> I, listen, I call the relatives and the friends that I like right now, and right. I'm good. I don't need to hook up with anybody else from 40 years ago. Or, and, and no, here's I the other thing I don't need to be told what's actually going on in the world from fucking Facebook. That's true. Right. I'm not going to get my news from a bunch of uh, knuckleheads that uh, watch uh, a meme or uh, a video on YouTube that's been banned 75 times. Probably good. Probably good thinking right there, John. I like yeah, how you think. Uh, <laughs> John Guanieri, thank you very much for doing this, brother. Uh, always, always great to have guys on the podcast from the DeanBlundell.com podcast network. It's called uh, Spear Talk. Go and download it. Subscribe anywhere you get your fine podcasts. It's a video cast as well. Thanks for doing this, dude. It's always, like I said on Twitter, it's always nice to have a guy on staff that knows how to neutralize another human being. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, you pray you don't ever have to do it, but kill him with kindness first. Yeah, no, I, I'm of that opinion too, but just as a as an alternative, it's just nice to yeah, have Yeah, no, around. I'm into it. I, I will break a forearm if I have to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, dude, good luck on your tour. Hopefully we can check again. Awesome. Thank you, dude. Take care. That is uh, John Guarnieri. Great guy. Not every day do you have like a you know a guy on your podcast who has seen the things that we all want to see, um, and and is able to actually navigate through them, and and then also you know just talk common fucking sense. It's just common sense. You wear a mask, I wear a mask. You don't want to wear a mask? Don't tell me to wear one. He's pretty sure there's aliens too. That's what I got out of that. Again, I want to know more shit from him. I want more details, Sean. Like I want, I want to know about Roswell. I want to know about uh, what's in the beast. Like I was scared. I was a scared. I was a scared to say, "Hey, what's the what's the presidential limo really like? What kind of anti gun stuff do you got in there? Do you got bombs? Do you got like uh, do you got a whole a load of tricks? Is, is it like a James Bond car? You know that kind of thing. Tell me about. Like I want to know about that stuff, but I was too scared. A scared. Where do they keep the rockets in yeah, that limo? Yeah, where's the RPG? Exactly. <laughs> Where are the snacks? Is there a snack drawer in here? Is there a place for snacks in the Beast? Is there a mini fridge? Just little things like that. Like, I'm fascinated by that stuff. Can you imagine working in the White House for like seven and a half fucking years? Seeing everything and just being that chill about the whole thing? 
Yeah, yeah, it's good. Unreal. Thanks to John for coming on the podcast. Thanks for you for watching. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, partners as well. Owner's Box Fantasy Sports, Weekly Fantasy Sports done right. Bigger payouts, better payouts all the time. Right now, they'll give you a $100 cash bonus when you sign up with $100. Up to $100 in bonus money when you sign up and you put your dough in. You don't even need dough. You can sign up for free. Go to ownersbox.com. The platform is incredible, all self-contained. You can customize everything. Make fantasy fun again. Weekly Fantasy Sports from uh, Owner's Box Weekly fantasy sports blue microphones home of uh dean blundell.com and the podcast network the official sponsor of the actual entire network they've outfitted almost every single one of our people with these beautiful blue yetis and if you want one we'll get, we're gonna give you one you just got to send us your podcast you go to dean blundell.com click on the show us your pod link and it's brought to you by blue microphones you'll win a brand new blue microphone if we select your podcast uh you'll also win a brand new mic arm and you'll also win these really slick headphones really slick and all you have to do is send us your podcast. So what you do is you leave us a link. We'll go and check it out. And uh, Bob's your uncle, Helen Durant, as my dad would say. Uh, and when we pick that winner, you'll be a member of the podcast network as well. We'll give you all new blue microphone stuff, and uh, you're on your way. You show us your pod contest, courtesy of our friends at Blue Microphones. Who wants Gitch? You want Gitch? I got Gitch. You want Gitch? I got lots of Gitch. Ed's Gitch. Ah, This is the kind of thing that you order for, like, a boyfriend, husband, brother, when you know that you can't go shopping because it's really tough to go shopping right now. Ed's figured it out. He's got his own branded gitch, luxury underwear, pouch in the front, super slick, super movable, super breathable. And he wants you to give you four for the price of three with promo code gitch three. Use promo code gitch three. Go to edsfineimports.com. Uh, get your four pairs of underwear for the price of three now. Everybody needs gitch. You're going to have to fucking go through and recycle. The same thing with socks. It's like one of those things. Why not get the world's best underwear for your nutsack? Sleeping bag. Damn it. Right now. That's fineimports.com. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Join us at deanblundell.com. Sign up for the newsletter there. And have a great day, everybody. I'm done. Bye.